real life superpowers. I think that you need to respect the other side and you need to learn to teach them how to respect you, not by asking it, by earning the respect and making sure that they understand what they need to learn from you. But also don't forget that you can learn from them. So don't show up as a, as the sheriff, but build your trust and earn your respect from doing not by asking or by expecting people to respect you. Welcome to today's episode of the Real Life Superpowers podcast. I'm Noa Eshet, co-hosting here with Renan Menipas. Today, we interview Sagiv Grinchpen, a professional with two decades of experience navigating the complexities of the telecom and financial sectors. Sagiv has tackled numerous executive roles, managed large-scale projects, and led teams in both development and client engagement. He's also experienced at business development and running large delivery organizations. Beyond the roles and responsibilities, Sagiv has been keen in integrating acquired companies into vast organizations, directing teams of over 2,000 people. Let's get a closer look at his philosophies and origin story. Real Life Superpowers Superpowers. Sagiv, welcome to the Real Life Superpowers podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. How are you these days? What are you up to? Oh, that's, as you all know, that's a complex, that's a complex uh, time, you know, uh, nationally, uh, personally, business-wise. Uh, so it's more complex than, uh, than usual. And it's uh, like always, but with more intensity, always, uh, you know, balance between, you know, be- I'm not even talking about the balance between uh, work and life, but I'm talking in the in the business sense, uh, balance between the tactical and the strategic, balance between, you know, uh, bringing value to existing customers, sometimes customer complaints, sometimes, you know, uh, dealing with the um, teams that uh, that you know many of them went to a uh, reserve duty and uh, we had over 50 people that were on reserve and uh, you know so how do you deal with this uh, business continuity when uh, when people are on uh, on reserve and uh, global expansion and acquisitions of companies so ev- everything a- anything and everything i would say Okay, so like your day to day now is like between you know a, a, a war and where you have reserve duty, like have like fifty employees go to work, and at the same time you're actually you know like CEO, you're you're pushing forward and acquiring companies, right? That that that's a, that's a hard thing to understand how it goes together and you know a mindset. So it's very different, you know, def- very different mindset, and I would say that I need to change context you know uh, during the day many many times uh, and that's in general it's a difficult thing to do but it, but i would say that you know um you need to uh, understand and to balance between things that are long term to things that are short term and dealing with people that are on reserve duty this is here and now these are deliverables that uh, we promise to customers, we promise to the market, etc. And you need to see how do you uh, continue to serve your customer base and the commitments that you made, and how do you juggle priorities? Sometimes, you know, uh, on a daily basis, um, you know, I needed to shift, you know, company focus. Uh, on October um, because we needed to deal with things that are more urgent. But after, uh, you know, a few weeks, you're saying, okay, if I want to be, you know, a leading company also in two months, three months, uh, two years, 10 years, then you need to think about, you know, how do you execute on on long-term strategies? Um, So, it's uh, it's challenging, but um, but you need to force yourself to deal with both. 
And you're fairly experienced in respect to managing large scale operations and large teams. And I'm always wondering because m- many of the people that we interview are more uh, they, they manage small teams. like it's a startup, even if it's, even if it's 50 people, it's nothing near the skills that you're looking at. And I'm always wondering, how do you make that leap with respect to the mindset? because you are not able to micromanagement, micromanage, sorry, a thing. How is, what's the secret? Is it trust? Is it uh, company culture? How do you, how are you able to oversee anything that progresses at such scales? So I'll say two things. One is um, you need to understand uh, what are the things that you want to really touch and what are the things that um, you can kind of uh, pave the way and show in North Star um, and do whatever checks and balances you need along the way, but you don't need to be in every detail. And that's something that you learn over the years. I used to be as a team leader, as a, as a junior manager, I was very micromanager. And, and it does it doesn't work in scale but you need to uh, to you need to make sure that uh, that um, that the the direction is clear and you need to make sure that you have the right people to do it but I also have a lot of checks along the way it's not that uh, I don't I don't really believe in uh, you know fire and forget uh, I believe in in uh, setting up, setting it right, and then having, you know, checks along the way, sometimes every week, sometimes every month, sometimes every quarter, depends. But I do have, you know, checks along the way. Uh, I do have a lot of, you know, things that to make me feel comfortable, that things are not just happening, but happening in the way that I want. And another thing that is important um that is also something that I changed uh, during my career. Um, I used to surround myself with people that are a lot like me, same type of personality, same, you know, uh, same energy, same level of excitement. Everyone near me was kind of, uh, I was looking for clones. And then I realized that, um, that I have, you know, that my team has a lot of blind spots because everyone is looking at the exact same way. And then I learned how to, uh, even when I interview, I'm not looking for somebody who is going to be like me. I'm looking for people that can cover a bigger space, if you know what I mean, kind of a different type of personalities, different, uh, you know, different mindsets. So we can be, you know, a, uh, a larger team in the virtual way of things. But you said to set it up right. And I'm wondering, how do you know that you're setting it up right? Is this trial and error? Mostly. Um, that's what I called fail fast. So, um, you know, uh, you're trying to set it up in the best way you can. Um, even, by the way, even that we are a fairly large organization, uh, we are not formal. So uh, if uh, a developer needs to be in the meeting, then a developer will come to the meeting if he is the expert in his space. It's not that, uh, you know, I'm talking only to vice presidents and they will talk only to the level, uh, to the director level, nah, because I don't think it's working. Because then you lose a lot of things in translation. So you bring the right people to the to the setup and you do the right brainstorming together and you put the right framework. And then, you know, as as you start going, you're trying to, you know, as I said, you're trying to fail fast and then, you know, recover or change direction or do whatever adjustment you need to do in order to, uh, to continue and not wait until the end of whatever uh, effort you are going through and then realize that it was a... Uh, a catastrophe. So, but to tell you that uh, that it's always working, no. Um, but that's that's the best uh, the best way that I that I find uh, successful. 
Let's say, let's say right now you're taking a new CEO job. Okay. What would be the first thing you do? Okay. When you get there. The most important thing uh, is to understand the culture of the organization. I believe that the organizational culture, and I know that it sounds like a cliche, but I really think that the, the culture of the organization is what drives a lot of the success or failures of the, of the company. Because even strategy, uh, you, can, you can change, and I, I change strategies, but the culture of the organization is the most difficult thing to change. Uh, requires a lot of effort, requires changing of people sometimes, uh, requires different mentalities. So uh, the first thing that I will understand is uh, what works in terms of culture and um, and how do I want this uh, this company to uh, to be. But how do you know what works in terms of culture, especially if you're just starting? Talking to the people, talking to customers, talking to the board, uh, walking the corridors, uh, sitting at the at lunch with them understanding how it's a lot of you know watching um, and you know less talking and more watching. And what do you look out for and listen to? To the pace, to uh, what is uh, the people's agenda? Uh, what do they think is working and not working? Um, you know, people tend to uh, to speak and the answers are, are there. You just need to know how to, you know, take the stuff, take the, the items that, uh, that are meaningful and uh, ignore, you know, noises and, uh, you know, internal, uh, internal or specific agendas of specific people. Um, And, and your own experience on, on how, how you think things should look like, um, most of the answers are there. You just need to, uh, to look for them. So if, if you get the answers themselves, okay, how do you, what do you implement? Like give me an example of an implementation of a new culture. Like what do you start with? So, you know, there are many, uh, many dimensions of, uh, of what do you, uh, of, you know, how do you uh, build the right culture but you know customer centricity um, delivery uh, meeting commitments meeting budget um, you know um, care for employees uh, formalities there are many many aspects uh, and by the way by no means I'm in a you know a organizational uh, culture expert, uh, all things that I, you know, I learned from my own, by the way, also when you acquire companies, it's exactly the same. You know, you, you look at the company, you look at the management. Um, and I can tell you that that's also something that I, uh, that I change over the acquisition, by the way, I've done already probably almost a dozen acquisitions in my, uh, in my career, seven of them are in priority. But I, I've also done before. Uh, something that I that I changed is um, if before, if my earlier acquisitions, I mostly care about the product, the technology, the customers. Now I first look at management, and if the management, if the management is not the one that I think can uh, can run can run with me for a you know for a while, then I'll walk I'll walk away. And it's something that I haven't done earlier. Did it ever happen to you that you were thinking of acquiring a company and the management seemed solid, but then you realized there is a too big a gap uh, in the culture and the procedures of the company and that it couldn't merge? Yes. Um, I will even say that there was a company that I, um, that in hindsight, uh, I, w- I wouldn't have bought because of this reason. Um, so, uh, and, and on the flip side, um, there is a company that I bought that I didn't think that the, that the product is, you know, super, super power. Um, and because I thought that the management is solid 
uh, with the right attitude, with the right mindset, with the right team under them, uh, I ended up acquiring them. Uh, and it seems, and it's, and it's a successful one. So um, I really think it makes a difference. Good management can turn companies, you know, uh, even if they're not super successful to very successful and vice versa. So um, I truly think that it's, um, that it's one of the most important aspects. It's true that you know if you don't have product or your customers are not uh, are not happy you know it's not uh, it's not a one thing but it's uh, I put way way more emphasis than I've done in the past and and when you do look into acquiring a company and with respect you know to your acquisition strategy is this more about keeping a competitive edge and being innovative or more about looking to grow the Um, the, the revenue and, and and I guess the answer would narrow down to uh, you know revenue always or talent I, acquisition yeah but right right but I'm but I'm wondering how much as a company uh, are you trying to keep a disruptive edge you know there are many reasons uh, or not many but there are multiple reasons why 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 companies buy other companies and Uh, you know sometimes you buy a competitor sometimes you buy you know a, a, um, sometimes you buy talent sometimes you buy patents sometimes a, a global expansion etc uh, I all my acquisitions in priority were all for one reason and one reason only was portfolio expansion so product portfolio expansion Um I don't buy because I need revenue. Um, it's true that it's accelerating growth, etc. But, um, but the main reason is portfolio expansion. All of them, all of them were, uh, were for this. And that's part of, part of my strategy. Uh, because I do believe in, uh, you know, expanding the value that I, uh, that I bring to, uh, to my customers. And as a result, I grow revenue, obviously, but, um, but that's, uh, that's the reason why, uh, why I do it. So you've, what, when you have a manager, so we're talking about great managers, right, or talents that, that you got in. Give me the three characteristics that are most important for a great manager. I would say a good balance between, um, between strategy and, And execution and it, again it depends on which level of managers but in general you know um, people that are uh, that care about executions uh, if they are customers so uh, you know customer centricity meaning they are responsive to customers they know how to talk to them they understand what they want etc um, and I would say know how to grow the people under them. So it would be like it would, it would be like they're good at giving service they care they're empowering and persistent sort of yeah 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 uh, exactly like this um, and they know how to empower as you said they know how to empower the people under them so so people so they can grow and the people under them can uh, can grow as well uh, because that's how that's how you scale that's how you can do more and uh, that's how company grows. We're excited to be collaborating with the Israeli website CTEC, owned by Kalkalist, Israel's leading business newspaper. CTEC is the gateway of the Israeli high-tech to the tech world and vice versa. If you're not already a regular reader, we strongly recommend that you check out kalkalistech.com, C-A-L-C-A-L-I-S-T-E-C-H.com, to stay up to date on all high-impact stories from the Israeli tech scene. So when you were a child, what is your dream of being when you grow up? Ooh, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, I wanted, to be honest, I wanted to be a musician. I, you know, in high school, uh, I studied computers. And at the end of uh, high school, I said, one thing I know I don't want to do, I don't want to work with computers anymore. So as you understand, it didn't work out. It didn't work out very well. Why didn't you want to work with computers? Why did you say that to yourself? I don't know I, I I thought that it's boring I thought that it's um, 
that it's not exciting, um, which by the way, after that, I, I changed my mind completely. Um, after the army, army, I didn't deal with computers at all. Um, but uh, after the army, um, I started looking for a job um, and I didn't know, I didn't know to do anything else. So I said, okay, what can I do? I can either work at a gas station, but uh, I know I know how to develop software. I started working. I, I started going from one software house to another, and I said, "Guys, give me a chance." I think the fourth or fifth place that I uh, that I knocked on their door, they told me, "You look like a good guy. We'll give you a chance. We'll give you three months. We'll see how it goes. If if uh, if you are okay, we'll let you stay." I said fine. Uh, why didn't you try to be a musician? That's a good question. Uh, by the way, I'm still, I'm still asking myself, but I play in a band. So uh, I, do play, I do play every week. What do you play, by the way? I play, I play a lot of instruments. In the, in the band, I play keyboard. Uh, so piano is my, uh, is my strongest instrument, uh, but I play a lot of instruments. Almost at every point in my life, I studied, I studied another... Uh, I studied an instrument, so I play uh, multiple. So I'm, I'm still trying to understand how somebody who is so creative and you know um, has music, you know, so deep within your soul. How did you? Wh why did? Was it really that practical? Like, okay, I need a day job, and and music is probably not going to be pr a promising path. So let's take let's compromise. Uh, no, no. Um... Unfortunately, it wasn't that deep. Um, I was just, you know, I, I got my first job because, uh, again, I was five years in the army. As I got out of the army, I, I, I found this job. And then one thing led to another. Uh, but I will say that after, uh, after a few years uh, of break, then I started developing and uh, I really found it fascinating. So I... I fell in love with it. I really liked it. I liked the, um, I liked every bit of it. I was working until midnight, and I, I didn't even look at the at my watch, uh, wanting to go home. So, um, so kind of, um, um, I decided I decided to stay. You found the creativity within it. Yes, absolutely. There is a lot of creativity. Um, I'm not even sure now that we're talking about it about uh, the the characteristics uh, I forgot I forgot to say creativity that's super super important and by the way there's creativity in in every aspect of you know every person of what it does there is creativity and innovation in marketing in sales in uh, HR in uh, technology um so you can be innovative and cre and uh, create in and creative in everything that you do so um it's not i don't think that in uh, developing software or even in uh, being a, a finance person you can be less creative than a musician it's just different type of creativity so do you do you feel that there's a common de de denominator in you be wanting to be in in music and liking the stage between you being in it as a CEO and like being on stage, is that like sort of like how you 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 got off of music and still got excited? You know, it took it took a while until uh, until I got on uh, on stages in uh, in this space. Did you enjoy it on the journey? Okay, on the way, as much as you do today. You know, it's it's a different type of enjoyment. I think uh, I enjoy it now more than uh, than I enjoyed it before. But you know, I didn't uh, when I was a developer. I didn't think about being a CEO. You know, it just uh, evolved as I went. Sorry. Let's talk about that. How did your leadership evolve? So I did many types of roles in a lot of in a lot of areas. Uh, as I said, I started as a developer, team lead, development manager, etc. Uh, after uh, probably six, seven years that I was in the development space, um, I was offered to uh, manage a, a project in a customer in Belgium. I moved to Belgium for two years. I went back to Israel 
uh, became a development manager again. And then uh, my, you know, somebody who from the business side um, is now a partner in Viola Private Equity said, you know, I'm going to meet customers that are using your product. Do you want to... You know, do you want to join me for a for a customer for a few customers visit for a week, and then during uh, the visit he offered me to uh, to move to uh, manage uh, a big customer in uh, in the United States. I moved to the United States after we went back a few months after I moved to the to the U.S. for something that was supposed to be two years, and uh, I was there for fourteen. Since then, I'm in this triangle of, you know, uh, business, technology, uh, you know, customers. But again, I managed after that a division in Amdocs. I was managing delivery. So I was all over the place. And, um, you know, few people ask me, how did you plan your career to uh, become what you were? And uh, my answer is that I didn't. Um, I wish I could say everything was well planned and I knew exactly how it's going to look like. No, you don't. Uh, but... You don't wish you should say that. <laughs> no, 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 it didn't. It, not, not even close. The only thing that I knew is that when there was an opportunity, I knew to grab it. Uh, but there wasn't kind of a mastermind plan that uh, that I knew exactly how it's going to evolve. My advice to uh, to people is just you know um, just open open your ears and um, and have enough people to uh, around you that uh, that uh, you have the right reputation and that's probably that's probably all you need. Um, and and a lot of luck. There is no there is no doubt. You need a lot of luck, as I tell my management. Luck luck must be part of the strategy. It cannot be the only thing in the strategy. And also, you know, luck, but be able to identify when uh, luck and an opportunity is right on, under your nose. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm curious because it sounds like your transition from developer to manager was pretty smooth and that's interesting in the sense that it's a very common problem that first line managers you know they're good at what they do developing and suddenly they have to manage other people and that's an entirely different skill set and without some coaching or guidance or somebody to look up to a mentor uh, they, a lot of them fail also causing churn and problems within companies so what helped you be able to do this successfully You're talking from the technology side to the business side? Yeah, pretty much. Like them being able to, instead of, you know, uh, coding yourself, now manage other people. Oh, okay. First of all, some of it is people skills that, um, that I know it's not a good answer because either you have it or, or you don't. But I think that... Um, The one thing that, uh, you know, the first advice that my manager at the time, the one who promoted me from developer to team lead, the first advice that he gave me, and I know that it sounds uh, shallow, but, but it's not, um, is, you know, um, he said it in a, in a funny way. He said, you're not a, you know, how do you call the person who uh, sends taxis from the, um, uh, from the taxi uh, station? Uh, he said, the most important thing is make sure that the right people are getting the right task. Not all your people are the same. Everyone has different abilities. Everyone has different, uh, you know, uh, motivations, etc. Make sure that uh, you're not just seeing, okay, who is free and, uh, and tell him what he does. So I think mo the most important thing uh, when you make it a little deeper is make sure that you, are, you, know, you know your people well. Make sure that you understand, you know, uh, how to motivate them. Make sure that you understand what what are they good at. Give them the things that are, you know, uh, playing to their strength and not playing to what you need. You, what you need right now, even if you need to wait a while for somebody who is the right person for the job, do it. And that's what that's, this was my first step in understanding. How do you manage a team in the in the most optimal way? And then you know there is a lot 
around it. Some of it we, we've talked earlier about, uh, you know, how to motivate the team, how to build trust, you know, um, how to create something that is cohesive and working uh, well together. How do you build an organizational structure that supports your strategy, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, we can probably talk, uh, talk about it for hours. Was it difficult at first, at least? The first time that I was managing people? Yes, absolutely. What did you find most challenging? The most challenging was to let go, uh, to make sure that uh, you know you don't understand exactly what people are doing in every second and how do you balance between what your jobs and you know managing because at the beginning I was managing, I think you know four or five people. Uh, and I was still wanted to be, you know, hands on myself. So how do you uh, balance between people that are, by the way, some of them were more experienced than me. How do you balance this uh, this relationship, etc.? Yes, it's uh, it's challenging, but it's uh, challenging fun. So how how do you overcome those challenges? I don't know if I have a specific recipe of uh, of how do I, of how do you uh, overcome it I think that you mostly need to you know you need to respect the other side and you need to learn to teach them how to respect you not by asking it by earning uh, earning the the respect and making sure that they understand what they need to learn from you but also don't forget that you can learn from them so you know don't show up as a, as the sheriff um but you know build your build your trust and earn your respect you know from doing not from not by asking or by expecting people to uh, to respect you and i think that's um by the way still still happens when uh, when i was walking into my ceo role um so the exact, exact same exact same exercise as as it was I don't know twenty something years ago. If if I would ask them what they think what they think about you, okay, your team or employees, what do you think they would say? How would they describe you? I will differentiate between uh, between business and personal. Um, I think that on the personal side, they will say that um, I'm not a formal person. They will say that I'm funny um, because they're saying it. So uh, it's okay. They're saying it. Don't worry. You're not saying it on yourself. <laughs> Self complimenting myself. <laughs> they will say that I'm very busy. I'm always uh, doing stuff. That they will say that I'm hard worker. That's what I would. I hope they would say that I'm a nice person. On the business side, I will say, they will mostly say that I am um, that I'm rounded. That I that I that I know about a lot of a lot of you know that I know a lot about a lot of things. Sorry, I know about a lot of things, and that's because the journey that I went through. So I understand technology, I understand sales, I understand marketing, I understand the operations etc so um i think that's mostly what um what they will say do you miss being hands on not anymore to be honest i i used to i used to uh, when i first started being uh, when i was starting to manage managers then you're getting further and further away so at the beginning i was missing it I am hands-on in different type of ways. For instance, there are uh, strategic deals that I manage the sales process myself with the customers. I'm in every meeting. I'm doing the follow-ups. I'm taking the action items. I'm, so, uh, so uh, this is you know, so different types of stuff. Um, I do feel that I'm hands-on, but I know when do I need to dive. Uh, and when do I need to uh, to step out? And those processes where you are hands on, is that sort of because you just feel like it or because it's necessary? I would say probably a little of both. 
I hope that uh, that I'm doing when I feel like it because it's useful and uh, but definitely when something is more fun then you feel like more being involved I will say that even in um, in companies that I acquired um there are some that I'm super involved because I I like it um Uh, I like the the material I like the customers etc you know there are stuff like uh, retail like hospitality these are areas that are fun to deal with so I'm more involved in in areas that I don't it's not that I'm uh, but sometimes you know it's more it's more fun so um so I would I would say probably probably both so um let's talk about uh... How are you able to manage stress? I think it comes with age. With age, you manage stress better? What? That surprises you? Managing stress better? Yeah. Yes, of course. I'm, uh, okay. I, I can understand, but go ahead. Yeah, it's true when you get to your parents' age, then it probably goes the other way around. But uh, I, I used to be much more stressed, much more stressed when I was younger. Although my job now is probably way, way more stressful than, uh, than the job I had uh, 15, 20 years ago. Maybe I feel more in control uh, to a large extent. Maybe it's the journey that you went through and you fell into so many, uh, so many bumps and uh, so many holes in the ground that you need to crawl out of. That, um, you feel like you can trust yourself. You've already been it's not your yes. first rodeo yes so that's that's I would say that's the that's the majority you know trust in your team uh, to a large extent that's part of it and uh, and the rest is um uh, you know playing playing music uh, you know bees all kinds of stuff that that uh, takes you away from your day job what, what do you mean bees beekeeping mm-hmm. growing bees mm-hmm. where, where do you grow bees oh literally okay yeah. <laughs> literally grow bees by the way that's also can cause a different type of stress yeah I grow bees in my backyard by the way you can sit you can have coffee I would say you Half a meter from uh, from the beehive and no nothing will happen to you well, I'll, I'll believe that theory yeah we're not we're not that interested we're not that that interesting as we might think we are and and why do you do it the beekeeping so it started it started in covid and uh, I don't know four years ago looks like and um, yeah time flies literally. Yeah, we, you know, uh, we had a kind of a basil, basil uh, in our backyard. They always used to have a lot of bees uh, inside it. And then I started reading about it and I, I went to Amazon uh, and I bought, and I bought um, a, bee, a beehive without bees, obviously. And then I started, I started growing it, became a family hobby. And we're doing great honey it's like it's like you you can't stop at home managing people <laughs> even if it's bees <laughs> you need you build a hierarchy a company culture like I'm gonna go here I'm gonna go to a place and see the bees you know like with name tags and they're all organized culture there's got to be culture way, I have in in a regular beehive there are about I would say it changes it changes uh, dramatically between winter and the uh, And summer uh, but uh, you know during the high season there are probably over 10,000 bees in a beehive so um, but I once did I once did a kind of a, um, it wasn't a podcast it was a, um, a lecture type of uh, about the similarities between beehive and a high-tech company there is a, it's a fascinating animal I can talk for two hours easily about how fascinating a beehive is. 
in so many dimensions. And isn't it fascinating that like in almost everything, when you're into the details, it's suddenly wondrous and an entire universe to unpack, right? It's, it's a little like your um, developing uh, uh, experience when it wasn't interesting at first, but then you fell in love with it because you sort of dug deeper. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, like, as you said, like everything, you started uh, to uh, uncover a whole new world of, uh, of excitement. And if you're curious enough, then uh, you, can, you can find a lot of uh, things that you... Uh, and I'm sure there are thousands of other stuff that... Uh, and hopefully some of them I will, sti- I will still uncover. What would you say your superpower is? My superpower... I didn't, I never thought of myself as somebody who has a superpower, but I will say uh, working, working with people is probably, is probably one. And uh, the second one is, uh, I would say curiosity. These are the things that I would say um, are powers. I don't know if there are superpowers, but there are powers. (laughs) You would add curiosity also to that list of things to look for in people, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah now that now that you're mentioning it but i would say creativity even before curiosity it comes together right. creativity and curiosity one yeah. is the 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 attribute the second is the effect yeah you're right it's a good point and your kryptonite your weakness my weakness my weakness my weakness is probably that I don't, I don't stop enough. I don't, you know, uh, take a step back and, um, and, you know, look at stuff. I don't know how to slow down even for my teams. Uh, that's one of the things that I would say is that, um, that I sometimes push too hard. Um, and, um, that's probably something that, uh, that I, I think I should, uh, I should improve. And um, where would you say that you hope to be in, a, I, let's say, five years? I don't mean that like in a job interview question, but more like in a personal goals type of question. I hope that in five years I will, I hope I'm going to still work, but not in a business, you know, business environment per se. Uh, I would say something that is uh, maybe more of a non-profit organization or something that is more, that is not for, that is not for profit type of, uh, of job. So take my experience in the business world and, um, and do with it something that is, that is, uh, that is different. Yeah, it sounds like something that uh, people can uh, completely benefit off. After these four years, I'm, uh, it's a, definitely a thought. Like, uh, <laughs> four very interesting, imbalanced years, you know, that's, that's, a, that's real thoughts. Mm-hmm. So exactly. thank you so much. We wish for you to actually achieve what you set for yourself. And it seems uh, pretty promising much. based on your resume. So um, good luck with that. And uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for your time, Sagiv. Thank you for having me. That's all for today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to our podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, if you have a moment, we would really appreciate it if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform you're listening to. This will help others find our show. And as always, if you know anyone who you think would enjoy our podcast, please share it with them. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back as usual on the first of the month. Real Life Superpowers Superpowers.